Good morning. In today's video, we are going to be doing some more gardening. And it is May 3rd today with um, yesterday's temperature was about 50 degrees. And our last frost date here in zone 4B is May 15th. So that's about 10 days, a little more than 10 days away. And the 10 day forecast does not appear to have any temperatures below freezing. So, but May 15th is our average last frost date. So that also means that we could get a frost on May 20th. And I can't see that far um, into the future using my weather app. So the question is, um, so my my um my first thought is i could plant my corn and beans because it'll take them about a week to come up and by that time it'll be like may 10th but also if we get a frost after my corn and beans have sprouted then it's a loss like they won't recover from a frost and my corn and beans, like I plant too much to be able to cover them. So it's early enough that you're kind of running a risk by putting out your whole crop of corn and beans at this time. And the other thing is I have tomato plants and I'm gonna show you what happened to them last night. Um, I have all my tomato and pepper plants do I put them out and then just be prepared to cover them if the weather takes a turn? It's really just a gamble. It's really a gamble at this time of year. And so I'm gonna prepare the soil and possibly I'm gonna plant today. Possibly we'll just put some fence on the peas. Um, but the other thing is it's we have rain in the forecast and what if it rains from now, you know, for like for the next four or five days and stays too wet to get in the garden. And that brings me right up to May 15th, which isn't too late to plant. It just really um, brings our harvest really close to our first frost date in the fall. So in here in zone 4B, most of our crops are a one shot. We get one shot at most of our crops. So I'm not exactly sure um, if I'm going to plant today, <laughs> but we will see. But what I am going to do is I am going to fertilize my raspberries with some wood ash. And here is why. So this is some wood ashes from our daughter and son-in-law's wood burning stove. But these are my black raspberries and every year we, for the last couple years, we don't seem to get a full crop um, because something happens to them. They blight or they get cane borers or something. And we don't get the last half of the berries because they just dry up and fall off. So uh, my mother-in-law suggested that maybe adding some wood ash um, would strengthen the plants because possibly they are low in potassium. Possibly um, my raspberries need some potassium and that would help the plants be stronger and fight off the disease um, better. So this year, instead of just putting compost on my raspberries, I am giving each raspberry, each of my black raspberry plants a scoop of wood ash to try and make them a little healthier so that they can fight off disease. So over here is my red raspberries. And even though these produce abundantly and don't have trouble with diseases because they are an heirloom um, variety that we received from an old homestead here in the area. Um, I have a little bit 
of wood ash left and I'm just gonna sprinkle it over these raspberries. Um, you can use wood ash to bring up the pH level of your soil and it'll help with the root maggots and onions and other crops that struggle with root maggots or root issues. You can use wood ash to um, make the pH level of the soil less inhabitable for those pests. So now my, so red raspberries, no, black raspberries grow wild here in Iowa. And even though I've, I planted these beautiful black raspberries that promised to give me the biggest and juiciest berries. Um, the, those black raspberries were designed for commercial growers who are also willing to use pesticides and fungicides on their berries. And that is the number one reason that I am struggling because those berries aren't as good of a fit for the way I want to raise them. And to this day, after, you know, 10 years of trying to grow those, um, we still, most of our black raspberry harvest is still from the wild ones. So recently, um, I read something that Jill Winger said, and she said that grow what wants to grow where you live, and immediately I thought of my black raspberries because I babied and struggled with them for years and years and they don't really want to grow. I should just go and bring the wild black raspberries to the backyard and prune them the way I understand to prune them to get bigger berries. And I think that would be less of a problem than trying to grow these hybrid kind of black raspberries. There's something to be said about heirloom varieties. Okay, I have come up with a gardening plan for the day. Um, we are going to plant our whole crop of potatoes. We planted some red early short season potatoes um, a couple weeks ago for fresh eating. But I think today we're gonna plant our whole main crop of keeping potatoes because here's the thing, even if they sprout, and we get a frost after they're sprouted, the potatoes will be okay. Um, because that potato is under the soil, it'll, it'll just keep growing. Even though the green that's above the soil might freeze off and die, another green sprout will replace that one. So potatoes are probably one of the most intense things that we plant. Um, and it takes a lot of hands to get them all in. Um, the children have only a couple more days of school left, but today they will get out of school at 1.30. Um, so I'm gonna go prepare everything, and then I'm gonna count on them to help me put the potatoes in, and it'll go much faster. But because we didn't talk about it this morning before they went to school, and if I spring it on them and say, hey, we're all gonna go plant potatoes, the older ones already know what that means. They know that that means a lot of work so they're likely to um, have a bit of an attitude about it, which then, you know, leaks down to the little ones. So I am making grandma's mint sweet tea for them. And I'm going to sweeten up the kids with this grandma's mint sweet tea that they love. And we're going to take the tea out there and we're all just going to drink sweet tea as we plant the potatoes. And hopefully, um, that will show them that I'm willing to meet them in the middle. And it'll maybe it'll help with all um, the attitudes that I expect to get from them. So I am, you need two parts of water and I can put this all in the description for you. Two parts, one part of sugar to two parts water. That is grandma's recipe. Now, grandma liked her tea very, very sweet. I like to cut back on sugar whenever I can for my family. So I am going to do three parts of water and one part of sugar. So I have, I have 12 cups of water. 
so I need four cups of sugar. One, two, three, four. And I'm gonna bring that to a boil. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go out and harvest my mint. So now we're just gonna pick all the leaves off. And for those of you that are familiar with making mint tea and are gonna show up in the comments saying, oh, you really don't have to um, use just the leaves. You can use the stems as well. Um, yes, I am familiar with that. And my family, thinks that when I use the stems and everything to make tea, it has a bit of a bitter aftertaste. So, because I wanna make this special for them, I'm going to take all of the leaves off. And then I'm gonna rinse the leaves and then we're gonna put them into that sugar water. And I need, because I have 12 cups of water, I need six cups of leaves, approximately. And the more leaves that I smash into here, the more flavorful our tea will be. All right, we've got all those leaves pulled off and we're gonna go add it to our sugar water. And as our tea matures, um, we will make some of this concentrated iced tea and freeze it and then during the hot part of the summer it's real easy just to make some iced tea. The other thing that we plan to do is we will dehydrate some like dry it and we can make mint tea in the winter time and we can also tie it up in little bags and hang, hang it around in our basement and root cellar to keep the mice away because mice really, really hate the smell of peppermint. Okay, our sugar water is boiling, so I'm gonna turn that burner off and I'm gonna put all of my leaves in there. Oh, I forgot to rinse the leaves. Oh well, we'll just strain any dirt out. And I know that this tea has been grown completely organic and as wild as can be since the day I planted it probably 20 years ago. So I'm not worried about rinsing off any spray or anything like that. It would mostly be dust or dirt that has splashed up onto it from rain. So the burner's off, the leaves are all submerged I'm going to put the lid on and we're going to let it set. If I was making um, tea concentrate for the freezer, I would let it set for a good 12 hours, but the kids will be home in about four hours. So I'm just going to let it set for four hours and then we will strain it and we will serve them some iced tea. In the meantime, I'm going to go prepare the garden for potato planting. So here I have some mammoth sunflower seeds coming up and I didn't save any seeds last year because I remembered how easily they reseed themselves. Um, but I don't want them right here because this is where I want to plant my potatoes. So I'm going to dig them out and put them where I want them.
So the other thing I found when I was tilling the garden is this wire grass right here. And I don't want to till through this because that'll just compound my problem. So what I want to do is get underneath this grass with my shovel and then lift it out. Because this wire grass has roots that are sharp like razor blades, it will go through any and all weed barriers. And what happens is if I just pull this out, I'm breaking the roots and everywhere I break the roots, it'll give 10 more plants just like it. So the best way to get rid of it is to get underneath the plant early in the spring before it's sending out all those little razor sharp roots yet and lift it out and then I put it onto the burn pile. It is almost time for the kids to be home from school so I am going to strain these mint leaves out of my tea using a couple layers of cheesecloth and a strainer. So because this is a concentrate, um, we can dilute it by half or more. So I'm going to fill my pitcher about halfway up with ice and concentrate, and then I'm going to fill the rest of the way up with water. So when I brew this um, for overnight, or like 12 hours, and then one quart of the concentrate makes a whole gallon of iced tea. But because I didn't brew this more than like say four hours, um, I need a little more concentrate to make my iced tea. But you can dilute it as much or as little as you want, whatever your taste preference is. So now that the children are home from school, we're gonna get started with our potatoes. We have about 30 pounds of Kennebec potatoes to plant, and these will be the potatoes that we store all winter. Mitchell is digging a trench to put our potatoes in, and everybody else is working on cutting them. We cut our potatoes in halves or thirds or quarters, depending on the size of the potato. The only thing we focus on is making sure that there is a sprout on each piece of potato. And we don't let them lay and cure after we cut them because we're not planting them so early that they'd have a chance to rot in the soil. Because our soil's already warm, they will sprout before they have a chance to rot. All right, here we go, planting our potatoes. So the reason we dig a trench is so that we have room and soil to continue to cover the potatoes when they start sprouting. So at first we're just gonna cover them with about an inch of soil. And then as the potatoes sprout, we'll keep using this soil to cover them more and more and that actually um, stimulates them to set out, send out more roots. And then more roots, of course, means more potato harvest. And we are, the kids are using their feet as measurements. So we're putting each plant about eight to 10 inches apart. So I like to use my garden rake when I'm covering potatoes because I can get more soil with less effort. And then eventually when we have healed our potatoes with as much soil as we can, we will cover everything between the rows and up under the potato plants with some oat straw. And while I've got all my help out here, we are going to put some fence or some trellis up for our peas. And we are putting tomato steaks in and then we will fasten our trellis to the tomato steaks. So 
So in the past, we have always used chicken wire to make a pea trellis. And that always was so much work, especially when the peas were all done and it was time to put it away because we had to pull all the peas off of the fence and then we had to store the fence and it never rolled back up as neatly as when we bought it at the store. So then last summer when my in-laws visited, my mother-in-law was telling me how people in her Mennonite community have started using the net wrap that farmers use to make the big round bills. So we contacted a local farmer and he was willing to get rid of some of his end rolls that were too small to make it worthwhile for him to run through his round baler. And this, I can already tell that this is going to work a whole lot better than the chicken wire did. And what we did is we folded it in half and then we're just, you know, threading it back and forth over our tomato steaks. So when the peas are all done, we can pull them out and feed them to the animals. And then whatever's still hanging on to this net wrap, we can just throw onto the burn pile and we won't have to store it. So something is nibbling at my lettuce here. And I don't see any rabbit poop. So I really don't think it's rabbits. I do think it's blackbirds and they've got some of my cabbage all the way down at the end. But what for rabbits, we usually, we put dog or human hair. So we'll take dog or human hair and tuck it around the plants and that'll deter the rabbits. Um, I'm not sure if it'll work for, black, for deterring the blackbirds, but we'll see, we're gonna try it anyway. So the next thing we're gonna plant today is our sweet onions. And right now I'm planting the red onions and these will be for fresh eating. Um, these are not a good storing onion. So we are planting 50 plants of the red candy variety. And then for keeping onions, we are planting the Texas Super Sweet. And we planted a hundred Texas Super Sweet onion plants. I always try to do a real nice deep till where I'm gonna plant my sweet onions because onions really like a lot of loose soil to grow in. So we're calling it a good day in our garden since the children had other things they still wanted to do today. Hadassah wanted to take a trip to the library and the boys wanted to work on their weapons that they're making. And so we have an elderly friend that has been moved to an assisted living. And before we head to town to the library, we are gonna stop by her farm and pick some of her tulips and then deliver them to her at the assisted living. So later on tonight, as the sun was setting, we had a friend come over to tow up some more of our yard and turn it into garden. And this will give us about 500 more square feet of garden. And we'll probably put tomatoes and peppers down here.